My name is Angelo Robledo, and I am an archaeology student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. But I'm also on the board of directors for the World Atlatl Association and do talks about experimental archaeology and the history of stone tool and weapon development uh, in human history for groups all over the Southwest. So today I want to talk about some stone tools and then also atlatls, which are my, my biggest passion. Uh, so we'll start over here. And I just want to start with, with this, because this is an example, uh, you know, a replica of what an Alduan tool would look like. And Alduan tools are some of the oldest stone tools found by archaeologists. Uh, they date to between like 2.6 and 1.7 million years ago, and they were developed by Homo habilis, which was a hominid ancestor to our species, which is Homo sapien. Uh, and these are what we call mode one or pebble tools, because they were Take, uh, created by just taking like a river cobble or a river pebble and breaking off some of these flakes here. So this one just has one or you know two or three flakes taken off, and that gives it just enough edge to be used as a chopping tool. Flashing forward a little bit, uh, we have the development of biface tools, uh, and these are much better than these Aldewan choppers uh, because they are flaked from both sides and they create more of a knife shape. So if we look at, at this tool here, it's kind of beveled on both sides. It was flaked on both sides, and we call that a biface, so two faces, one face and two face. This makes tools sharper and stronger, uh, and also a little bit more refined. They're, they're easier to get into these smaller shapes. Uh, obviously, this tool is much smaller and more delicate than this large chopper, uh, but it serves a different purpose. And you can even have these bifaces in much larger pieces, like this knife blade, uh, which is about five and a half to six inches long, but created using a similar method. This is cool because this is actually a resin cast of a point that was found here in Las Vegas, actually. So this is an atlato point that was exca excavated at uh, Springs Reserve, and then this is a cast that they made of it. Um, but you can see, I mean, it's hard to see it on the camera, I'm sure, but these flake patterns are very similar to some of the flake patterns in the other tool recreations here. Uh, and the techniques are very similar, and it's a biface tool just like these other ones are. Um, so yeah, these tools are, are very difficult to make and made out of very various materials, but generally it's going to be either flint or chert, which is what this one is, or obsidian, which, uh, which is what these are. And obsidian comes in, in a variety of different colors. Uh, and it can also come in translucence as well. And I don't know if this will show up on the camera, but this is actually clear in some areas uh, and banded in, in other areas. So uh, these are just some, some of the tools. Uh, specifically, these ones are some that, some that I have made. And experimental archaeologists do a lot of work recreating and using ancient tools and technology in order to better understand how ancient people would have used them and how it, that would have affected their daily life. So now that we've kind of gone over some of these uh, basics of stone tools and some of these spear points and arrowheads, we'll go into atlatls, which are uh, something that I've been studying for about 10 years now. So an atlatl is a spear launching device uh, that has a handle on one end, a long shaft that's generally about uh, two feet long, and then a spur or hook at the other end. And, and occasionally it'll have this counterweight. Uh, and the way this works is that it connects to one of these longer spears, uh, something like this, which has a hole or a knock in the end, a little dimple. And the spur connects into that dimple, if I can do it, there we go, connects into that dimple and allows the user to flip the spear forward. Uh, so in, in a full throw, you'd step and you use this lever to flip, flip the dart forward. And by pushing the dart from behind, it actually goes a lot further than it would go if you just tried to throw a spear like this, like a javelin. And, it, and actually, the human body doesn't really work that well for throwing something like this, especially at a flat trajectory. So Olympic javelin throwers are throwing at an extremely high trajectory, but they're not aiming to hit a target. And they can throw uh, about 103 meters is the world record for Olympic javelin throwing. The world record for an atlatl throw at distance uh, is about 270 meters. So you're seeing a massive, I mean, over 200% increase in the distance and power you can get from the throw with an atlatl. And when you bring that down into aiming at something, like you're going to hunt a mammoth or a deer or a big horn sheep, uh, atlatls are actually incredibly accurate up to about 25 meters, which is a lot further than you could actually hit something by throwing a javelin. Uh, so javelins just don't really work that well in that flat trajectory. And a lot of the physics 
principles that show up in our lateral show up in other weapons as well. If you think about a bow and arrow, the bowstring engages the arrow in the back and pushes the arrow forward the same way that the atlatl pushes it forward. Atlatls were used all over the world, and the oldest evidence we have of atlatls comes from France, and it was carbon, radiocarbon dated to about uh, 17,500 BCE. However, it has been theorized through uh, bioarchaeological evidence. So bioarchaeology is looking at uh, ancient hominid remains or human bodies, that atlatls may go back as far as 45,000 BCE. Now for context, some of the uh, projected evidence for the oldest bow and arrows is only in about 15,000 BCE. So this weapon was used for up potentially 30,000 years before the bow and arrow was invented. And that biological archeo uh, the bioarchaeological evidence uh, is in a remain called the Mungo Man. And he uh, was somebody who died with extreme arthritis in his right elbow. And it's theorized that this arthritis comes from using an atlatl over the course of his entire life. Uh, and actually, modern atlatl throwers have elbow problems as well. And it's very similar to tennis elbow. Now, what's cool is that uh, Native Americans in the American Southwest, specifically uh, part of the, the basket maker culture, uh, which is about 50 BCE uh, in that area, created the basket maker style atlatl, which has these two finger loops that change the way that you hold the atlatl. Uh, these finger loops actually reduce the strain on the elbow and can allow somebody to throw much longer without developing that painful tendonitis or tennis elbow that potentially is, you know, was the demise of the Mungo Man. So you can imagine if you're relying on atlatls to hunt and you no longer can hunt because your elbow seized up, uh, then that's going to probably be the end of you. So uh, it's really cool how different regions developed different styles of atlatl that worked a little bit differently or di better that solved some different issues. Something else unique about atlatls from the American Southwest uh, is the development of compound darts. So compound darts have a main shaft, and then they have a removable foreshaft. And this is something that we really only find in basket maker style atlatls and in some uh, basket maker burials uh, that were excavated had both atlatls and a variety of darts with different tips uh, for, for this. Now the idea is that here in the desert it's hard to get some of these five or six foot long straight pieces of wood or sticks because of how dry it is. So you get as long as the pieces as you can and then you make up for that distance by adding this little foreshaft. And the cool thing is these foreshafts can be used in different darts as well. So here is a dart shaft made out of river cane that also will accept a foreshaft. And the hope is that when this enters something like a bighorn sheep, which is why atlatls were, uh, one of the animals atlatls could have been used to hunt, uh, hunt. if this enters the bighorn sheep, sorry, let me demonstrate this a little bit better. If we compare a compound dart to something that's not a compound dart, so just like a straight shaft dart, if this is sticking into the side of a bighorn sheep and it starts running or thrashing and it hits a tree, it could break the shaft. And it takes a lot of work to make one of these darts. So the idea of a compound dart is that when this sticks into an animal, the hope is that the main shaft will fall out and this foreshaft will stick into the animal. And then the hunter can pick up the main shaft, put on a new foreshaft and throw it again without breaking the dart. So a lot of innovation went in for different regions depending on the environmental stressors that they had and the different things they had to overcome. This is an example of an atlatl from Alaska. Uh, and this is a little bit longer than they would have been because they use their atlatls to hunt seal and to hunt waterfowl. And they enjoyed atlatls because they can steer a canoe with one hand and throw the atlatl with the other hand. Uh, and you can see, again, a little bit different design with this finger hole in the middle compared to these two finger holes on the side compared to the more kind of generic model that just has this what we call a hammer grip at the end here. So different regions develop them differently. Um, Atlatls stopped being used in Eurasia uh, when the bow and arrow was introduced. However, in Australia and in some parts of North America, specifically Mexico, atlatls continued to be used even after the bow and arrow was introduced. And there's various uh, ideas for this, but the atlatl word actually is a Nahuatl word, which is, uh, comes from the Aztec language, uh, Nahuatl language. And they used atlatls along with bows. They considered the atlatl to be a weapon from the gods and had a lot of uh, cosmological and religious significance attached to the atlatl itself. 
and, and used it during the European conquest. So a lot of what we know about how ancient people may have used atlatls comes from writings by the Spaniards during the conquest in the 1520s. Uh, so atlatls obviously had different names from different parts of the world. In Australia, the other major area where people continued to use atlatls all the way up into colonization or contact periods, uh, they called the same type of technology a Woomera. And in fact, the, na the Australian National Missile Testing Range is called the Woomera Range because of the homage to the original projectile weapon that was yeah, the Woomera of the atlatl. So uh, different parts of the world, different names, different designs for it, but still the same technology. Uh, and it's really incredible how widespread this technology was all over the world.